En matemática, a diferencia de lo que ocurre con otras ciencias, no hay premio Nobel. Por diferentes razones, algunas son un mito, pero esencialmente no hay. Sin embargo, el mundo de la matemática reconoce y le da un equivalente al premio Nobel a sus miembros una vez cada cuatro años. Y el equivalente del premio Nobel es darle una medalla, que se llama la medalla Fields. Y el doctor Steve Smale consiguió esa medalla, se la dieron esa medalla, en el año 1966 en un congreso que se hizo en Moscú. ¿Cuándo did you learn that you were going to get it? Oh, just a couple of months earlier. Yeah, one of the members of the committee, uh, I was driving with him in uh, France or Switzerland, and uh, he told me. You were not supposed to tell anybody? I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I did, except my family. Uh -huh. so. yeah, and, and what happened then? I mean, because that's another way of saying, hey, yeah. we recognize you as yeah. one of the best. Yeah, yeah. Well, at that time, you know, I, I thought it was a, a wise move of the committee. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, if they didn't do it, that's okay. I, I felt I deserved it, so that's the main thing. <laughs> well, that's interesting. It's, But it's there's a, you know, I, I appreciate all these things that allow scientific politics and their decisions, and so I don't worry if I don't get something, and I don't get too excited if I do, <laughs> because of this background scientific political environment which prizes are given. I've served on these prize committees, even the Fields Medal committees. So anyway, I understand that. So I don't get too excited one way or the other. Not, not too uh, not depressed if I don't get something and not uh, too elated if I do. So that's... Let's talk a little bit about the horseshoe. Yeah. What is it? How, I mean, I wouldn't be able to explain it to the audience. Can you? Yeah, it's kind of a formal mathematical model of what happens when you have some kind of dynamical process which is quite nonlinear. It moves things not in a straight line, moves it around globally coming back in the form of a horseshoe. Uh -huh. And when you make this formally uh, mathematical rigorous, you can see uh, this kind of chaotic uh, predictions. Things, uh, you know, not, not uh, what you expect in classical dynamics you see this unpredictability, like coin flipping. You can see that formally in the mathematics of the horseshoe. Uh -huh. Now, when you say that, can you model unpredictability? Yes. That's interesting. Yeah, that's right. It's like predicting the future. It, it's, well, it shows the limits of predicting the future more, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it's interesting, because remember what you told me before, I cannot predict the future. Yeah. But now, kind of, with your modeling, you I, are... I, no, I show the limits of why you can't oh, predict the future. Oh, I see. The model shows uh, the limits of predicting the future. Uh -huh. And why did you leave that area either, also? Or you're still thinking of those things? Oh, dynamics, uh, you know, I, all these things are interesting to me a little bit, and I do some topology, a little different topology. I spoke at this... Perlman meeting where he's supposed to have gotten the million dollar prize. So I had to think about how topology was enter entering my work, and it was. Mm -hmm. So I spoke on topology then, and the same with dynamics. It enters sometimes into my work, but my work is primarily in questions of you know, data mm -hmm. and uh, the mathematics of intelligence and the mathematics of, uh, of biology, too. When you say intelligence, what do you mean? That's a very difficult... A human and robotic and so on. Uh, you know, intelligence like the Google uh, mm -hmm. kind of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Intelligence like uh, cars without a driver in a race. Mm -hmm. Intelligence of how we see. Mm -hmm. human, that's human intelligence. Mm -hmm. Then the other car without a driver, that's a machine intelligence. But there's some of the same themes that have to do with the development of both. That's intelligence. Okay, but you told me that you're also dealing now with immunology? Yes. What are you doing with vaccines? What kind of vaccines and for what? <laughs> yeah, so the vaccine the problem, uh, somehow uh, I was led to these problems of immunology a year and a half ago, uh, two years ago. Mm -hmm. So I put together a group which would do a lot of experiments in the subjects of uh, eventually finding new vaccines for things like cancer or viruses. But it's too, the scope is too broad, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so I have to focus uh, our work. But the main idea is to 
in this more focused part of immunology to do very broad things that will go over to other parts of immunology and even science. So there is a, a theme uh, in what I, we do in immunology, which is kind of it's a universal theme, I hope. Uh -huh. So that's why I call our work uh, towards the mathematical foundations of immunology and uh, amino acid uh, strings. And what kind of, of math do you apply? I mean, what, what field? Well, I don't go into the, such a subject like immunology with too many preconceived notions. Okay. I have a background in some, I've been working in the last 15 years in something called learning theory. Uh -huh. And that gives me uh, access to some of these areas in biology in an, and in intelligence. Learning theory is intelligence. Mm -hmm. So I have that, those tools, extra besides the mathematics I've learned through the last 60 years. <laughs> well, there's <laughs> a lot there. Yeah. Um, I have a particular question to ask you. If you were to make a decision about what kind of math would you teach in schools, mm -hmm. different levels? Yeah. Now, given your experience, mm -hmm. you've seen it all, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. What would you teach and what you would not? Well, I would, uh, in education, both primary and university, uh, I would oppose, you know, such heavy emphasis on tradition, especially in math. I think that gives a big distortion of mathematics uh, because the main mathematical organizations are influenced by a, you know, a long tradition physics, for example. And they're not very open to uh, these new directions that are happening, mostly not in math departments, in statistics departments, computer science departments, and in these areas of learning intelligence and biology. And I would say uh, it's important to shift faster the curriculum and the courses so that the uh, students will understand better things, especially statistics like data and the geometry of data, new things that are happening now, maybe too early to put in the curriculum, but they could be understood by a broader student body mm -hmm. which wasn't so tied to the, what's called core mathematics. Mm -hmm. So I would revise the core. <laughs> well, that's very, well, the thing is that we are still teaching things that were good 400 years ago. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, and solve problems by, I, I usually say that we have, first we have the questions and then we have the answers. And at schools, usually teachers teach the solutions to theories or give answers to problems that the kids didn't ask. Yeah. And they don't have those questions. Yeah. I agree very much, and I think mathematics is led more by questions than answers. You know, I did this work in Poincaré's conjecture. That was an answer, <laughs> okay? Well, but you, you had a problem. You had a question. Yeah, yeah but in general, I, I was emphasize more the questions which were not simple, you know, not just the answers to old questions, but new questions. Right. That arose around the, along the way. Yeah, that are arising now. Uh, okay. Yes. Well, every every answer brings new questions. That too, sure. that too, but also new questions are given to us by biology, for example, new mathematical questions. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about your collection now, your collection of gems, stones. Yeah. I read that it's one of the top five in the world. Is that true? Probably. Probably? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Wow. That is, then I thought I, I was wrong when I read it, but you are <laughs> confirming that. Yeah. Do you, where do you have it? Let's start. Where, when did you start? Where do you have oh, it? And I, do you I started 40, 42 years ago, 43 years ago. Like a hobby? Well, it was more than a hobby because we uh, invested all our money into... Who's we? Well, at that time, my wife and, and I. Uh -huh. and, uh, you invested all your money in it, collecting stones? Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, we did. And we had money to live on. So we could still have money for vacations. but. Everything else went into stones. So I put it, you know, I was, uh, you might say, obsessed with collecting mm -hmm. minerals and uh, all the things connected with that, writing books, writing a main book, and uh, displaying very much, uh, keeping our collection in uh, the minds of the mineral collectors by, uh, you might say, advertisements, but they're statements with the big photos of our mineral collection in the main journal every month, a new, uh, photo, and things like that were fun and exhilarating. Where do you have it? Okay, we keep most of the value in the bank vaults in California. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. In the house? In the, no, bank vaults. Oh, in the bank, oh, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, that must be very valuable. I mean, oh, it's very valuable. It is? Oh, yeah. Any idea? Yes. Like? 
Oh. Give me a rough. Okay, what one piece, you know, of ours could be a million, two million. Mm, that's a lot of money. Yes. <clears throat> U.S. I, dollars. I understood that. <laughs> yes. I have a last question for you. In your younger days, your political views were not shared by some people in the U.S. Yes. They would have been loved here in South America. Could be. <laughs> you know, that's not a conjecture. You know that that would have been a fact. Yeah. How did you, how did you live with that? How did you learn to live with that? Oh, it was just it was an exciting challenge doing these things. Uh, you know, being an anti-war, anti-Vietnam War uh, organizer. Yeah, it was, it was exciting. I almost left mathematics for doing that. Well, but you were close to the Communist Party too. Uh, yeah, I was a member of the Communist Party early on. That yeah. was when I was a student. But uh, when I was against the Vietnam War, I was as far from being a member of the Communist Party. I see. Well, but being a member of the Communist Party in the U.S. is uh, different than being a communist member anywhere else in the world. I would say. Right, Wouldn't you agree? right. Yeah, it was. I didn't let people know that at the time. Uh -huh. But nonetheless, because of my political activities, I did lose my first job as a math teacher. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, I want to thank you very much for stopping by, for spending some time with us. It was a real pleasure to have you on our show. Thanks very much. Okay, my pleasure. El doctor Steve Smale, una de las personalidades más importantes del siglo XX y en lo que va del siglo XXI, uno de los matemáticos más importantes de la historia, aquí pasó entonces por Científicos Industria Argentina. Ya seguimos. fosilización es el proceso que permite que los huesos de animales antiguos se conserven a través de los millones de años. Pero también hace que esos huesos se mineralicen y se vuelvan frágiles. Por eso, el paleontólogo profesional debe evaluar qué tipo de herramienta utilizar en cada situación y cómo extraer el fósil sin dañarlo y sin perder la información que lo rodea. A pesar de que los dinosaurios eran animales muy grandes y seguramente muy fuertes también, los huesos que nos han dejado no lo son tanto. Entonces, para trabajar en los huesos de dinosaurio necesitamos herramientas mucho más delicadas, tal vez como un pincel para ir liberando el polvo que se acumuló encima. Y también herramientas con punta que nos permiten liberar el hueso de la roca, de la roca que lo contiene. Una vez que tenemos bastante liberado y bastante sedimento, lo que necesitamos es despejar un poco el área de trabajo. Nos ayudamos de un cucharín que nos permite ver un poco mejor lo que tenemos. Pero llega un punto en que la roca eh, ya no está más floja y entonces necesitamos herramientas un poco más robustas, como una masa y un cortafierro, que nos permiten romper la roca para abrir el área y ver qué más hay. Y una vez que el área está un poco más limpia, volvemos a las herramientas finas. Pero para la excavación de un dinosaurio de gran tamaño, como son los saurópodos o los carnívoros que encontramos en Argentina, Necesitamos herramientas más fuertes, como masas, cortafierros, palas y también un pico. Después de la pausa, viajamos a Ushuaia para ver de cerca la golondrina patagónica y te contamos por qué se agregó un segundo a la hora mundial. Ya volvemos. 